to record. Yeah, it's in recording. So I, I know the QLS students have already followed uh, machine learning classes, but on different topics. So I will actually start by explaining the difference between what you did and what you were going to do. Okay. All right. So I would like to, to start by a small uh, introduction. On the question of what is uh, machine learning? First, uh, for those who have no idea about what that is, that, that's a good question to, to start from. So machine learning is what? It's, it's say a set of tools of algorithmic tools, but also of, of mathematical tools, which are used to learn from and make predictions about data. Okay, so of course you are all aware that uh, machine learning is directly connected to data and actually large amount of data. Okay, we call that big data. Okay? And uh, we want to use this data to make predictions. And really the key word here is, is prediction, okay? And I will insist strongly on that word many times and we will see why. So machine learning, what is that? It's how to learn from and make predictions about data. Okay, so the cheeky words are predictions and data here. And of course, you want to do that in an automatic way. Okay, and that's all the point. We want to design a method, a procedure that is able to extract interesting features, interesting information about the data automatically. Okay, so I guess that most of you have heard about machine learning, about artificial intelligence already many times, but I'm not sure that it's very clear for all of you, what are the subfields of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and first, what is the difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning? Okay, so I will here put AI for artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. May I have a question? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, okay, so how machine learning different from extrapolation or interpolation? So we, this is exactly what I will discuss. Okay, so machine learning is about making, making predictions and prediction is not only just interpolate. Okay, so we will exactly answer the, that question today, hopefully, okay? So um, AI is a huge field, okay, that, that started in the, in the 50s, actually, and it means essentially everything that is used to make predictions, okay, but AI is, is a bigger uh, box, a bigger field than machine learning, but actually nowadays machine learning is really the part of AI that is really moving forward the faster, okay, this is where the most research is done. Um, and this is a, it's a very exciting research field, so I, I advise you to, to know a bit about it. So that's why you're here, so that's great. So in AI, you have a subpart, which is machine learning. Okay, so AI is a big thing, and there are things inside AI that are not machine learning. For example, what we call expert systems, which are inference systems that are uh, using just very like logical trees of, uh, so, sorry, trees of logical decisions. So it's just if then else, but like very complicated structures of if then else. And these are called uh, expert systems that are really coded by hand. And if you have a uh, rich enough structure of if then else, you get a system that starts to, to make uh, rather complex decisions. But this is not what we want to study. We want to study things that make decisions automatically. You don't want to code yourself if then else, okay? You want to use data in some way and 
the procedure must find this if then else's if you want in an automatic way. So machine learning is a sub part and there are essentially three three huge boxes in machine learning, okay? So the three boxes are supervised learning. This is what the course is about. Okay. And what is supervised learning? Essentially, it means learning from labeled, and we'll see what it means, examples. So it's procedures that are fed with many, many examples. Okay. Uh, examples are here uh, dependent on what problem you want to, to solve. Okay. So one example you want to, to, to distinguish between automatically between images of dogs and cats. Okay. What you will do with supervised learning is first uh, create a huge database of images that you label, that is for each of these images, you know if there is a cat or a dog on it, and you, you give it to the procedure, okay, when designing this big data set. And from these labeled examples, the labels here being dogs and cats, you want the procedure to learn to automatically distinguish the two types of images, okay? And the key notion here is prediction, in the sense that what you want at the end is that your final procedure is able on new images that were not seen in this training data set, in this data set that you used for tr to train the algorithm, you wanted to be able to predict the labels of these new images, okay? So this is what we will focus on, okay? Then you have the field of unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning. And here it means essentially learning from unlabeled data. Okay. So it's the same from unlabeled or raw data. Okay, so here the, the supervised learning, you want an algorithm that finds patterns in raw data. Okay. Raw data could be images without any labels. These images are not given a label like dog, cat, house, whatever you want. They are just pure uh, images. And you want that the algorithm automatically find patterns, which means, for example, common points in some images in the data set, so that you find structure in your data set in, in, in an automatic way. OK? So I know that the QLS students have already studied uh, algorithms in this class okay so uh, typical pro uh, tasks in this uh, in unsupervised learning are called for example clustering so clustering means finding groups in raw data okay you want to find clusters or dimensionality reduction okay where you want to find a more compressed representation of your data without losing too much information, okay? And the key uh, procedure in this, in this class is called PCA for principal component analysis, okay? While in supervised learning, the type of tasks we will consider are essentially two. There is regression, Okay, and classification. And we will see what it means. But essentially, regression means doing predictions about variables, about quantities that are continuous, real numbers or real valued vectors. Okay. While in classification, you want to make predictions about discrete variables. That's it, okay? So if you want classification, you could think of it as a special case of regression, but actually the type of 
strategies that we will use for classifications are different enough from what we will do for regression so that we give it another name okay so for example this this, this task of uh, of classifying images of dogs and cats is a classification task okay a regression task could be let's say you have uh, many uh, features about some um, some patients who are a medical doctor you know the weight the height the age the the many characteristics about your, your patients and you want to use the, this data in order to infer some unknown quantity about these patients, for example, the probability to get a cancer, okay? This probability is a real number between zero and one and therefore you are doing regression, okay? All right, do I write good enough so that you can read? I hope so. Otherwise, uh, I can make more effort, but I will be slower. There's uh, a question in the oh, chat. Yes, don't worry, I see the chat. So regression just means doing inference, doing prediction about real valued variables, about continuous quantities, okay, that take a continuous value. And the last box, okay, machine learning, is what we call reinforcement learning. Okay. So the QNS student also had a course about reinforcement learning with Antonio. Okay. Uh, so what is reinforcement learning? Reinforcement learning is about learning through interacting with a environment okay so essentially that's a nice framework to model what life is but many other systems of course but a typical system you want to study with that are uh, living systems this is the, the field of research of antonio so essentially you have an agent which means a, a system which interacts through some uh, sensors with the environment, okay? And so you get a signal from the environment that can lead to pain, that can lead to reward, that can lead to nothing. And from this partial information that you get through this possibly noisy interactions with your environment, uh, the agents need to learn how to uh, behave in a way that it maximizes some reward. So reward just means a quantity that you want to maximize. So typically in living systems, on the long run, a living system is trying to maximize its, let's say, uh, um, lifespan, okay, or uh, happiness or whatever, okay? So you define some, some, some quantity that's called reward, which is usually a, a, a real number. And the agent through, interacting with this stochastic environment needs to define a strategy, what we call a, a policy, such that is able to maximize over the long run uh, the reward, okay? So this is also what is used in robotics, okay? A robot is something interacting with a complex environment. The environment is, is random, is stochastic. There is uh, many sources of noise, many uncertainties. And still the robot needs to, uh, to reach some goal, okay? And to do so, you need to, uh, in an online manner, to, 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 to define a policy, a strategy, a behavior. And this is what reinforcement learning is about, okay? So learning by interacting with an environment, okay? Shaping a behavior. And the behavior is what we call also a policy in the language of reinforcement learning, okay? All right, 
So now I would like to, to ask you, do you have an idea of why machine learning became so popular in the last, let's say, 10 years, actually? Uh, there's been really a, a revolution going on in the last 10 years. And do you have any idea of why that's the case? So let's say why machine learning uh, is so popular since around 2010. What are the things that have changed in the world so that machine learning became so attractive to many scientists while the research field exploded? While, let, let, let me be, be clear on something, machine learning here, I put it as a subpart of AI, but actually all that is a subpart of statistics more generally. Okay, machine learning is based on statistical tools. Okay, all that is about statistics. But why, why, why we call now not just statistics, why is that called machine learning and why did things change so quickly? What happened? Do someone have uh, reasons? Um, computational powers became better. Uh, we have a lot of data and it's also cheaper than um, employing many people to do the same amount of work that a computer can do in a longer period of time. Yes, so one thing is a technological advance, which is indeed an increase in computational power and actually an exponential increase in computational power. In particular, the development of what we call GPUs, graphical processing units, okay, which are rather cheap processors, which are able to, uh, to do very simple computations, but in a very efficient and, and fast way. And actually, most uh, modern machine learning algorithms, such as deep learning, neural networks, and all that, can be written in a way that they interact very naturally with these GPUs. And so you can learn, you can train complex learning algorithms uh, with these GPUs in a very fast and efficient way, okay? So we have the power to train these machines because don't think that this is, that machine learning is magic and that it solves every problem you want. That's not true at all. And this is what the course will be about, is to understand that it's not magic. It's not a black box that is able to solve any problem you want, okay? For it to work, you need, computational power, let's say have that, but then you need clean and enough data, okay? You cannot extract information from something if there is not information in this thing, in this data set, okay? If this data set is too, too scarce, too noisy, is not enough to, for the task that you want to, to solve, you can use uh, the, the fanciest algorithm that exists, uh, like the 25 layers of neural network, if you want, you will get nothing, okay? So the quality of your, uh, of your algorithm will also depend on the quality of the data. So indeed, the second thing is that we are in the era of big data, okay? We have a lot of data. Uh, and this, is, uh, this has exploded since, since the, around 2000, okay? And now we have data on everything you can think of, okay? And so we have also, so this computational power, we have an exponential increase in memory also, okay? Because it's, it's nice to be able to, to, to process data, but you need to be able to, to store it in some way, okay? And now we have ways to store a huge amount of data, okay? But keep in mind that the theory of, machine learning, let me, let me call that machine learning, but uh, actually we should call it statistics at this stage. But let's say the theory of neural networks as a typical example of a machine learning algorithm, the theory of neural networks is not something new, okay? So neural networks, if I draw here the number of publications concerning neural networks as a function of time, okay? So here I will put, when do you think the study of neural networks has started? 
1970s. No, you're very far. Oh, sorry. Started in the 60s. Okay. A decade. Okay. 70s, 80s, 90s. Okay. And around 2000. Uh -huh. And something really happened around 2012. Okay, and then I will put here 2015. And here I will put 2017 because things are accelerating. So I need to put here the, the scale is not linear. So the number of publications in, let's say, neural networks or machine learning broadly is a curve that looks around like this. Okay, there's been a peak around the 80s that died out, okay? And around 2012, things have exploded, okay, exponentially. So what happened is the, around the 60s, people studied what we call the perceptron, okay? Which is the simplest possible neural network that we will study in detail in this course. And the perceptron is just one neuron, essentially. It's the simplest model of a single neuron processing data, okay? And at this time, people didn't have uh, com huge computers and all that. They really, you know, with a, with a, um, I mean, maybe I can show you the picture. All right. I mean, people were really, you know, encoding a uh, neural network by plugging cables in a very complicated manner. And the, like what we code now in, in one line was like a, a room at this time, but people were playing with a simple neural networks in the 60s and were able to solve very simple classification tasks, binary classification tasks between two, two, two classes. And uh, so, yeah, this, is, uh, this was uh, around uh, the 60s. And around the 80s, uh, the, the, there is this bump in, in activity because people started to develop theoretical models for that, okay? And in particular here, people were playing, theoreticians were playing with things called like the upfield model, okay? So the upfield model was the first model coming from statistical physics. That, were, that was a, a simple, let's say, a idealized version of what we call a, a model of memory, okay? So it's a model that is it's, it's a rather complex neural network, much more complex than the perceptron, that is able to store patterns and according to some dynamics to recover these patterns, okay? So that was the first connection also with um, with the uh, neuroscience, okay. And so people studied to death this Hopfield model and related models, okay. But then you see that the gradient here became negative. The, the less and less research was carried on, uh, carried on these models uh, after this bump, because essentially we said everything we could at the theoretical level but there were no re real ways to implement these machines, okay? We didn't have the computational power to use these machines in, a, in, a, in an efficient way to retest them, okay? The computers were not just powerful enough. But then the GPUs appeared around here, okay? And so people had the tool to really code more complex neural networks to, to, to solve complex tasks. And in 2012, okay, that was the birth of what we call deep neural networks, essentially. And people, for the first time, solved extremely complicated tasks, which was the classification of huge data sets of images, okay, um, with uh, hundreds or thousands, I don't remember, let's say hundreds of different labels, okay, of, of different classes of images. If you had the uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of images to classify and these machines were able for the first time to solve this task around 2012. And around 2015, we reached superhuman performances. 
It means that on classifications of complex images for the first time, a neural network was able to, be, to perform better than a human. In the sense that if you were giving the same data sets to uh, random people in the population, and you were asking them to classify these images according to all the classes, people do mistakes because sometimes you can confuse a dog for uh, I don't know what other animal or you know you can make errors. And these computers, these, these algorithms at this time made less error than humans. Okay. And since that, of course, there are many, many tasks where these algorithms became more efficient than us. In 2018, uh, this is AlphaGo. So you must have heard about that. This is the first reinforcement learning algorithm, but that also used neural networks that was able uh, to uh, solve an extremely complex uh, game that we thought uh, unreachable for, uh, uh, for further decades, but that was a mistake which is the, the, the Go, which is a game, a, a complex Chinese game, okay, a board game, which is a combinatorial problem uh, with a, an exponential number, large, very large number of possible uh, plays. And uh, uh, so this, this algorithm is not able to just test all possible configurations to find the best one, which is done for chess. Chess was solved by this, uh, by simpler algorithm a long time ago before that. Go is much more complex. For the first time, it was actually better than the best player, uh, who was a Korean player. And since that, the revolution is, is continuing, okay, and self-driving cars, whatever, and, and you know about that. Okay. All right, so let me clarify a further point, is the difference between machine learning versus classical statistics. Okay, so what is the difference between statistics and machine learning? So the difference is the following. In statistics, okay. I may have questions. Yes. Uh, why didn't you classify my uh, supervised learning in the categories? as the fourth categories. Supervised learning is here. Uh, semi, semi supervised learning, like uh, between supervised learning and unsupervised learning. No, this is not semi supervised learning, it's, it's unsupervised learning. It's no, I mean, I mean, okay, so uh, now we have three categories. Huh? Why didn't you put semi supervised learning as the fourth category? Uh, I mean, if we can create as many categories, I mean, you know, it's just a arbitrary uh, uh, choice, but of course you can create further subcategories as many as you want. At the end, you will create one category per algorithm, but semi-supervised le learning is want to put it there in between supervised and unsupervised. It's, uh, I could create many more categories, of course, this is a rough, distinction, but uh, actually classically, we divide machine learning in this way, but of course there are many sub parts. Okay. Uh -huh. Yes, thank you. Okay. So in statistics, the type of questions you are interested at, uh, in are questions related to estimation. Okay. So estimation means what? It means that there is some unknown quantity that you are interested in, okay? And what you do is to gather data which contain information about this unknown quantity. So for example, you have a, some process that generates data and this process depends on some quantity that is unknown, okay? And what you do is that you, you gather a lot of data and you want to estimate, to infer, okay, this is a, also what we call inference, this unknown quantity, okay? So how to use data? To estimate
unknown unknowns okay and this is also called statistical inference okay and classically this is what i meant here by classical statistics classically the quantity that you want to estimate let me say the unknown it could be a vector of of, of unknowns the unknown you want to estimate is low dimensional Okay. Low dimensional means that there are just few unknowns you want to recover. And by few, I mean compared to the size of the data set. Okay. Low dimensional compared to size of data set. Okay. So typically you have, let's say, the unknowns quantity are, let me call them X. This is a vector that generally belongs in RP, let's say. This is the unknown. Or what we like to call signal also in signal processing. Okay. And then you have data that depends on these unknowns. But let's say this data is much has a higher dimension, Rm, this is the data, okay? And the classical regime of statistics, estimation, classical statistics is concerned with regime where M is much bigger than P. And this is what I meant by low dimensional, okay? P is low dimensional with respect to M, okay? So I have a lot of data to infer, to estimate few quantities, okay? And really the, what interests you here is to recover this unknown quantity. Okay, you want to find these unknowns. This is what you are interested in. So examples could be what? Could be, um, I don't know, let's say you, you record many uh, trajectories of falling objects in different setups. Okay, let's say from diff different initial conditions, and you know the laws of motions. Okay, you know you know Newton's laws, but you don't know the the gravitational constant. Okay, so you 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 record all these trajectories, and you want to recover the unknown, which is the gravitational constant. Here, there is just a scalar number that you want to to estimate from this large amount of data, which are these trajectories. Okay. Uh, please. Yes. Uh, why the why of X is the future map of X, right? Sorry? Why of X is the future map of X? No, 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 no. Y of X is just data that depends on the unknowns. Uh, X uh, belongs to RP. X is in RP, yeah. But why uh, Y of X dimension is greater than X dimension because it is it's like we start with like uh, a signal with five and when we compute the future map we get something like no no no, no. Lewis, I, I didn't mention any future map or anything here I'm not talking about future maps so I think uh, I'm doing something much simpler and, and here I'm not talking about machine learning I'm talking about statistics just saying you have some some unknowns Okay, you generate data according to some process. This is a data generating process. Okay. Yes. So at the end, you get data that depends on these unknowns that are correlated in some way to these unknowns. And your task is given this large amount of data, this, this M data points, is to recover this few unknowns of dimension p okay oh, yes i get it Thank okay you. can someone give me another example is it like is it like when you have parameters of a distribution and then yes so for example estimating parameters of a distribution could be could, could be that yeah, yeah. Could okay. be that. 
could be is, is, is a problem of this form. Yeah. So can, can, like for example, if you if you are a physicist who are in a lab and you're doing experiments where you do interferometry and you want to measure the speed of light, okay? Or you're doing and you do a lot of interferometries and you gather a lot of data and you want to just estimate a, a number and you know you know the laws you know this data generating process in the sense that you assume how the data is connected to the speed of light you measure this data and you estimate the speed of light out of it okay all right and really the the interest you have is to recover precisely the value of the unknown okay so this is estimation in France, this is classical statistics. Instead, what we are interested in in this course is machine learning. So what's the difference? The difference is that you're not necessarily interested in estimating precisely some unknown. What you are interested in is to use data to make predictions. And you see, this is a very different concept, okay? It's not that there is some unknown that you are interested in to precisely recover. It's just that you want to design some model, some algorithm, some procedure that will exploit your data in a way that you are able to predict some quantities, some, some, some interesting features, some interesting stuff about new unseen data that was not used to train your model. So you see, it's, it's very different. It's not about estimating something. It's about prediction on new unseen data. OK? But of course, machine learning will use a lot of methods from statistics. OK? But still, the, 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 really, the idea, the, the core question is different. OK? And also, usually, in machine learning, we are concerned in very high dimensional regimes. What does that mean? It means that you will have a lot of data, okay, to train your model. But now your model will also be parameterized. I will call the parameters of the model theta, okay, which are quantities you will need to, to fit, to tune in order to, to, to set up your, your, your model that will then be used to prediction. So we'll generically call these parameters theta. <coughs> and this theta, let, let's say that it is of dimension, uh, let me call it uh, n, for example. And n is also very large. Okay. So we are not anymore in a regime where we want to find something of low dimension. We will also want to find something of rather high dimension. Okay. But you see, these parameters, they, they may represent things that are maybe don't have a physical meaning or whatever. They're just parameters that parameterize your learning system okay they do not represent a physical quantity with a precise meaning that you want to recover like here the gravitational constant or the speed of light these parameters are just parameters that parameterize a model okay and the task is to find a model able to predict correctly for new unseen data okay okay All right, so is there any question before I enter a bit more formal uh, definitions? So this was the introduction. All right. So now I would like to, before, so I already mentioned, um, Few applications. Ah, maybe I can show you something actually. I want to show something. One second. Um, maybe this will give a, a nice picture of what's going on. Give me one second. I need to connect with this computer. Take it as a two minute pause. Um,
I'd like to show uh, to show you one or two nice slides to illustrate what we said already, but uh, I cannot connect to internet. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm working with two computers and my iPad, so it's like super. Uh, not efficient, but this is the best I can do. Um, come on. And we have networks problem, of course, just to add a layer of uh, complexity. Uh, all right, so maybe I would show. Um, uh, one second. Okay, I will I will show you this this thing next time. It's just a, I wanted to illustrate the classification of dogs and cats. Okay, that, that were just nice images, but I think you you get the idea. I will show you next time. All right, so let me now um, be a bit more formal, okay? So let's start a part that I will call the machine learning ingredients. By the way, I sent you uh, that, but I, I'm very closely following this this uh, these notes that I sent you. Okay, this uh, this review, uh, which is very well written. So if there are things that are not clear, I, I advise you to to read that and also to check, you know, independently of what I say, to complement and maybe to read that before each course, or as you as you feel. All right. So when we set up a machine learning problem, there are essentially three parts, okay, three main parts. And this is common to all tasks in supervised machine learning, okay? The procedure is always the same. So let me right away give that, and then we will discuss an actual application and code a bit uh, to see what is going on, okay? So the first main ingredient of uh, a machine learning setup are what I call the observables or the measurable quantities or simply the data. Okay. Um, actually, this is part of the data. I will see what I mean by that. Okay. Let me remove this part just observables or measuring uh, measurable quantities and i will call that x so one measurable quantity or one observable is a vector in rp okay where p here is the number of features okay so the features are what are the components of this vector okay and features are assumed a priori to to be interesting to describe the model 
uh, sorry, the system. I don't want to use the word model here. Or for the task at hand. Okay, so features are things you can access. Okay, these are data you can uh, gather that you think may contain information connecting to some task you want to solve. So um, let's take uh, one example. So if you are again a medical doctor, okay, and you want to predict uh, the sensibility to certain person to, to a certain disease, okay, what, what we will naturally do is measure Okay, is to access all the possible characteristics that you can think of about this person, age, uh, height, weight, uh, uh, origin, whatever. Okay, uh, And these are things that you think may connect in some way to the presence or not of this disease. Okay, So these are called features, these quantities that you, you, you gather. Okay, But maybe there are certain quantities that you do not think at all to be interesting for the task you want to solve. If you want to predict, if you want to design a model able to automatically predict if someone will get a cancer or not, you could use uh, his, uh, let's say, um, the, the fact that he's a lion or a Sagittarius or uh, the time, the precise time at which this person was born, or let's say, uh, the number of friends this person has on Facebook, whatever, you could measure that, you could ask this question. But it looks totally irrelevant, okay? You would not do that. You would not gather these pieces of information because they seem not connected in any way to the presence or not of a cancer. And I would tend to agree with you. So you will not call these features and you will just not measure them, okay? So the features are what you gather and think may be connected in some way to what you want to predict, okay? Um, if you want to solve a task of classification of images of dogs and cats, what are the features in this case? Can someone try to tell me? The distance between their eyes whiskers maybe in the case of cats i don't know yeah but this is this is rather complicated to to obtain so it means that you would need to take each image and then to measure each of these things between you know rather vague concepts i mean this, this seems very complicated and i see the answer on the chat and the answer is correct the features in this case are just the pixels the pixel values so if you have images you consider that the information is contained in the pixels and you don't want for necessarily to pre-process in a complicated manner and to pre-extract information in an arbitrary way from these pixels. What you, want, what you want is to design a model that will do that automatically for you, okay? So what you give it in this case are just the images themselves. And in this case, the images are parameterized by very large vectors, which contain the values of the different pixels. Okay, so the features in this case are just the pixel values. Okay. Um, so in our example of, uh, uh, I gave you an example of a problem from estimation, which was, uh, let's say you have many trajectories of falling objects and we want to estimate the gravitational constant from the knowledge of the laws of motions, okay? Let's think about another related application. Let's say that we are, we are st stupid. We don't know the laws of motions. Uh, and we are still able to, uh, to measure all these complicated trajectories under different setups. And we want to solve a, a prediction task. In this case, what could be a prediction task? It could be given an initial condition, so an initial direction and an initial velocity. Can you predict? the end point okay at which point on the floor this the object will fall okay so this is a prediction problem so you want to design a model that will automatically take as input this this this, this piece of information 
and predict the endpoint. In this case, the features okay, are the initial speed, okay, the initial vector speed, the initial velocity, and the initial direction. Okay. So in this case, this would be a six-dimensional feature space. Okay, you, you have the, 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 the vector for the direction and the and the vector of velocity. Okay. Actually, you just need the velocity here. It's a three-dimensional vector. Okay. All right. So we have the features. Now we have a second uh, we have a second thing, which is what I will call the labels. Or the outputs. Okay, so this will be denoted by just Y. Okay. That is a real number. So again, if this real number is discrete, we talk about classification. If it's a real number, it's regression. Okay. So the label is essentially. The, the quantity you want later to predict, okay? But in your training data set, you have access to these labels. This is why we call that supervised machine learning, okay? So let me give examples again. In the case of classifications of dogs and cats, we have these images. The features are just the pixel values. And the label in this case is just a uh, binary number, which is plus one if the image is a dog, if it's minus one, the image is a cat, okay? And for a huge data set, some human experts has classified all these images. So you have the answer for all these images, okay? Uh, but then later on, on new data, which are not labeled, the prediction task will be to automatically output the correct label, even if you don't have access to it, okay? Is it clear? Okay. So for each um, so the data set then that I will call D is a set where associated to each input XI. Okay, so the data set is a set of uh, of pairs where the input is a p-dimensional vector and the associated output or label is a real or discrete number, okay? And i goes from one to n, or maybe I will call it capital N. So this capital N is the number of data points and each data point is what? is a pair of input and output, okay? So this could be the image, and this is, uh, let's say in the classification task, this could be zero for dog and one for cat, okay? Or in the, in the problem of predicting the endpoint of trajectories, the inputs would be the initial vector. And for each trajectory, you would measure the final endpoint for many, many, many trajectories. Okay. And the label in this case would be the value of the endpoint. Okay. The position of the endpoint of the trajectory. Okay. Uh, I don't understand why uh, you put zero for dog and one for cat because I think uh, you based on the big style so that you based on the proportion of the uh, blue main, uh, three main color, right? I, I didn't understand. Uh, okay, so um, I I thought that uh, you you based on the the pixel to classify the dog or the cat so that you based on the proportion of the colors that uh, uh, contribute into uh, is that if, if I'm not wrong you have the image of the the dog and the cats and then you 
you have the pixel of each image, mm -hmm. and then you uh, will assign a number to each pixel based on the color, um, based yeah. on the color that uh, like three main colors that yeah. we yeah. Okay, let, so, let's speak in gray in, in black and white just to see. Uh -huh. okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. And so, what is the question? Oh, okay, so now it's gray and uh, dark and white, so it's clear that is zero and one. No, of course. Yeah, initially I thought it's a color. No, but if you have colored image, of course, instead of you know feeding the the, the algorithm with just uh, one vector, it would be three vectors, or maybe you can set all these three vectors in a single one of bigger size. Okay, you, you can always do that. There is no problem. But generically, I will call P, okay, the dimension of the inputs. And we will always, in this course, consider simple applications where the input can be thing as just p-dimensional vectors. Of course, in more complicated tasks, maybe the data is, uh, is not represented directly as a vector, but you need to find a way to represent it efficiently to, to feed your algorithms, okay? So also, for example, in, in applications where really you want to process data, uh, images, okay, in reality, what you would do is not to vectorize the image, because if you vectorize the image, you are losing the two-dimensional structure. And of course, many interesting features are contained in the two-dimensional structure, okay? If you vectorize that, you totally lose this information. So you have special, in this case, neural networks that take as input, not vectors, but matrices, okay? And will exploit the two-dimensional structure, okay? Or if you have uh, images with colors, then the inputs are not matrices, but they are tensors, which means you have three dimensions, okay? You have the dimension of the color, which is a three-dimensional uh, uh, space, and then you have the dimension of the pixels, okay? So you can feed, algorithms with tensors, there is no problem, okay? But I will just consider a simpler setting where the, the, the inputs are just vectors, okay? And like you can take whatever data you want and you can vectorize it, okay? But you may lose information if you do so. So in certain application, you don't want to do that. But I will, at the moment, say that the inputs can always be found as vectors, okay? Yes. Can I ask another question? Yes, yes. So in the label or output, it, could, it can also be vectors. Say it again. Uh, here you put that the label or output is in R, but yeah. can it also be a vector? Yeah, the output can also be a vector, yeah. Okay, thank you. So here I, I, I'm, I just want to emphasize that the output is of lower dimension than the input. So I think of P as something rather large. But here I could put, uh, if you want, uh, a little m, r to the m. And m, yeah, you could have a, as, as output a, a small vector, no problem. OK? But at the moment, I would just consider these are as numbers. OK? All right. Then I will construct the matrix of inputs, okay, X, by concatenating all these inputs. Okay, I have N of them. So each time I write a vector, I think of it as a column vector. So here I just created a matrix whose rows are the inputs. Okay, so this is a matrix of size, the number of data points times P. Okay. And N, I call it the number of data points or the number of samples. You will I will use mostly that word samples and this is the standard vocabulary okay so concretely this matrix is what is a huge matrix like this where here you have x11 here you have x1 n 
Okay, here you have x to uh, one, x to, uh, sorry, I'm uh, getting confused. No, I'm putting uh, x, uh, yeah, sorry, it's x one, uh, x two, x two. and so on and so forth okay and the last one you have x one p x uh, n p okay and so each of this column is called a feature this is the feature P. This is the feature one. Okay. It's clear. So we'll always represent data in this form. Okay. The inputs. While the vector y is just okay. All right, so this is the first ingredient. We have data, okay, in a matrix form. We have this matrix X and the vector Y, okay? And so the data with this representation can be just, uh, is just uh, a pair of X and Y, okay? Inputs and outputs, okay? The second key ingredient is a parametrized model. Okay, so now that we have this data, we need to, def to, to design a model to process this data, to learn from this data, to predict for new unseen data. Okay. So I will generically call this model F. This is just a function that will take as input X, which means one input data point. So again, it's a vector in RP, but it will also take as input a vector of parameters. So this, this function is parametrized by parameters that I denote theta that will be of size M, okay? And it spits an estimate, a prediction that I will or write as F of x theta, or I will write it y hat of theta of x, or simply y hat, okay, if, the, uh, if there is no possible confusion, okay? These are just three notations for the same thing. The hat here is a standard notation in, in statistics. The hat means estimated, okay? This is your estimate. This is the estimate by the model of the output associated to the input X, okay? So we are trying, this function F just defines a generic rule between inputs and outputs. And all the point is to have a rule, a class of functions, which is rich enough to represent complex relations between an outputs and that we are able to learn. Okay, that we are able to, uh, to learn. Yeah. So the point will be to find these parameters. Okay, this is the model parameters. Learning will be about finding these parameters, the, 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 be the best parameters to predict on new unseen data, okay? Okay, 
So again, let me just say for the last time, if Y belongs to an alphabet, which is uh, real, which means that the outputs are real number, we talk about regression. And if instead it's discrete, okay, so the Y at the, out, the prediction belong to certain discrete set, okay? Then we talk about classification. Okay. All right, and what I will call, what, let me define another set, which is the set of functions F, F theta. So I will denote it F theta like this to emphasize that it's a parameterized model, F theta. Okay. So this set of functions, which are parameterized by theta. So for each value of this vector of parameters, you have a new function. Okay, each time you change theta, you get a new function. So this defines an infinite set of functions if the parameters are continuous. And we call this infinite set of functions our hypothesis class. Okay. In the sense that from the beginning, by deciding to use a function of this form, you are making the hypothesis that such a function is a good model for the task at hand. Okay. Will be a good predictive model if you are able to learn the parameters correctly. Right. So your, 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 final function, your final choice will belong to your hypothesis class. Okay. Which is a set of parameterized functions. So can someone give me an example of uh, such a function F theta and what are the parameters in this case? Can, can someone give me an hypothesis class, essentially, that, that you know? And, and I know that you know. <laughs> so. um, the linear function. For example, so With an hypothesis class could be a set of functions, f theta, that could be of in the form uh, theta zero plus, uh, sorry, so, so you said, that, so for example, the set of polynomials, yeah. theta one X plus theta two X squared. So for example, this could be a, a, an hypothesis class. It's the set of all polynomials of order two. Okay, it's a valid hypothesis class. Can someone give me another example? A neural network is an hypothesis class. Okay, we will write down at some point formally what is a neural network. I don't want to write it here, but a neural network is, 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 is actually just a function at the end. A neural network is something that takes an input and that spits an output. And this neural network has a kind of feed forward structure in layers like this. And what are the parameters in this case? What parameterize this? rather rich and complicated function that we call a neural network. It is the weights and the biases. Okay, the weights that connect the neurons in a neural network are the parameters of an hypothesis class of neural networks. It's clear? Okay. And the task is once you define an hypothesis class that you think is good enough for your task, you need to find which function in this hypothesis class 
is the best one. So you need to find which parameters are the best in your case, given the data you have access to. Okay. Okay. So let me emphasize again. Once you define a function in your repetitive class, this function will use after training, which means after finding theta hat. So I mean, by hat, I mean, again, once you fixed once you have chosen values for the parameters, it will be used to predict, okay, the output, the label of new unseen data points, okay? For X unseen, during training. Okay. And the learning problem is really finding the best, and we will see what we mean by the best, theta, the best set of parameters, okay? Which means the best function in your hypothesis class, okay? So now we have a model, we have an hypothesis class. We need to learn now, okay? We have data, we have a model. So we need to learn in some way. And how to learn, which means how to define a procedure to find the best theta, okay? What you need for that is a cost function. Okay. Or what we call also energy function. Why cost or energy? Because in physics, an energy function is something such that you want to minimize it, okay? Systems tend to minimize their energy to find equilibrium or free energy, but some notions of energy, okay? Here, the cost function is also something that we want to optimize, in particular to minimize, okay? We want to minimize the cost. And I will write down what do I mean by the cost, okay? So the cost is some function that depends on uh, the a label and your model applied to the associated input, okay? When I don't write any index for X and Y, it means the associated pair of X and Y, okay? The X here is the input that goes with the associated Y or y is the label, x is the input, okay? This is also written, this cost. It's a cost between the true label, okay, of a given data point, and your estimate of the label according to your model, okay? This is the output of your model, right? And this is a function that belongs to the non-negative real numbers, okay? So we will not allow this cost to be negative, okay? Essentially, we want to make this cost as close as possible to zero. And this cost will be used to evaluate the performance Okay, or quality of the model
on data set. Okay. And so learning is what? This is just optimizing of the cost, optimization of the cost. So what do I mean by that? Learning here concretely what it is, it means finding the theta hat, which is the minimizer, so it's the argmin. If someone is not familiar with what the argmin is, just tell me. Okay. And this again, I could denote it similarly as um, sorry, I used the notation with the uh, where is my data? Okay, I used upper indices for the index of the data points. So let me be coherent. It's Okay, so here, what is the operation I'm doing? I'm evaluating the cost for each pair of input and output. I'm evaluating the cost, which means some non-negative function, some notion of error between the true, the true output the true label and the estimated one or the predict, I prefer to use predicted one. Okay. So for each pair in my data set of input and output, I'm computing the deviation, the cost between the true label and the one that predicts my model. I sum all these costs over all my data. Okay, this gives me a number. This number depends on theta, which means on the parameters of my model. And what I do is that I try to minimize this overall cost this global cost over my parameters, which means I'm trying to find in my hypothesis class, the function, the model that minimize the overall cost. Okay, this is learning concretely in supervised learning, okay? Is that clear? So this has to be clear. If it's not, please ask because otherwise it, it will become a bit uh, difficult to follow from, from now. Can I, uh, can I, uh, so it should be a summation over all the data, uh -huh. the data, not, I think because if you think of it, it's like, if I have less data, then, then the cost, will be less. Yeah, but it does not matter what is the absolute value of this cost. You see, I can multiply by this cost by 10 billion. It does not matter. Uh, you can always rescale this cost in the way you want, because anyway, you're taking the minimum, and the minimum does not depend on the global scaling factor, right? So uh, what you're, okay, okay. I think what you are saying is that, I think the answer to your, Hesitation is that it would be exactly the same if I average over the costs here. It's the same. OK. 
Okay, so it should be the average. It, it is the same. If you take the average or not, it's just, it's just that if you don't take the average, this will be a bigger number, but still you are looking for the minimum. So you see that oh, okay. this, this one over N here, which means taking the average or just summing, does not change the value of the minimizer, right? And because when we train the model, the n is fixed. The n is fixed, yes. Okay, thank you. N is maybe 10,000, okay? So actually, yeah, maybe you don't want this cost to be too large, so you take a one over n, no problem. But it does not change the, the, the end value, the minimizer of this, of this cost. With any global factor here, I could I could take instead of one over n, I can take any scalar b, any rescaling factor. It does not change anything to this optimization problem. Okay. Uh, I I have questions. Uh, uh you mentioned uh, um, about uh, I, I remember that you you mentioned a word uh, deviation. Is that uh, you are implying? Uh, we calculate the deviation of the predicted one and the true label. Mm -hmm, exactly. So uh, for for uh, almost every uh, uh, I mean mentors, I mean uh, algorithm, we also do the same. Yes, yes, yes. Whatever is the algorithm you you want to think of, if you are doing linear regression that we will discuss at length, or much more advanced uh, machine learning techniques such that neural networks. The problem will be always in this form, in the sense that you will define an hypothesis class, it could be linear models, which are simple, or very rich neural networks with, with very fancy architectures. Does not matter, this defines an hypothesis class, you have data, then what you will do in any case is define this cost function and evaluate the cost over each pairs of training data that is inputs and outputs that you have access to like this and try to find the parameters that minimize this cost. Okay. Then of course, all the difficulty, one obvious difficulty is that this operation here is not innocent. Finding this minimum can be extremely hard. Okay. Or very computationally demanding, or it's not even clear in, in in some cases that you can find a minimum because this cost, maybe it's a non-convex function. It can be a very complicated function, this cost. Okay, it can depend extremely in a very complicated way on theta. And theta may be a very high dimensional object. Okay, so finding the minimum of this cost is a hard problem in general. Sometimes not, sometimes yes. If the cost is convex, at least you know it has a single minimum. It doesn't mean that you will find it efficiently, but at, no, at least you know the minimum is unique. If this cost is non-convex, you're not even sure that there is a single minimum. And it's not even clear how to find a good minimum. And what does that mean, a good minimum? OK, so uh, this is not the end. <laughs> uh, this is not the end, OK? But learning will always take this form, OK? You have a model, you define a cost function, you find the parameters that minimize the cost. You try to find the parameters that minimize the cost. Okay. So concretely, I also have a question. Yes. About the parameter um, dimension. Mm -hmm. Can we set it here, or do we uh, also learn the, the how to set M? M. How to set M? I mean, how do you choose M? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. <laughs> and we will try to, like the next two, at least two courses will be dedicated to that. To understand that choosing M is not an obvious question at all. Uh, so it means, because from what I understand from what you said, it seems that in machine learning, you don't care much on the parsimony of parameters. No. It depends. Maybe you want your model to be interpretable. In this case, you, you, you want maybe to enforce parsimony, and we will see how to do that. Okay. But not always. Okay. okay. But okay, here you are raising uh, a very good point is the fact that 
okay, you could tell me, okay, Jean, that's great. You just gave us uh, what machine learning is about, but then I could always take the richer possible hypothesis class. Uh, so, and, and just try to minimize in this extremely rich hypothesis class, a kind of universal hypothesis class and uh, whatever application it should work because my model is extremely rich i just need to find the best one in this super rich class okay but we will see that there is a trade-off if you don't have enough data it might not be a very good idea to have a too rich hypothesis class and this is all the issue behind machine learning is to find also a good hypothesis class given the amount of data and the quality of data that you have access to Okay, and we will see, we will discuss that at, at length. Okay. Um, okay, so let me say a last thing and then I'm done for today. So, concretely, this cost could be what? And this is the one we'll mostly restrict to uh, in this course, but we will also talk about other costs. But for example, in regression, typically when the variables, the labels that you that you have access to are continuous, the usual cost that we take is the square square uh, function. Okay, so it's in, in this case the cost is called the mean square. So if you take the cost between y and y at to be the square function. Uh, sorry. Okay. Or then you see that this averaged over the data points cost is naturally called the mean square. Error or MSE. Okay. It quantifies the average over the data points square deviation between the true labels and the predicted ones. Okay. And learning would mean, in this case, minimizing the mean square error. Okay. So just a, a remark, uh, at some point, I, I will go a bit more in detail in this remark, but if you are using a mean square law, implicitly what you are assuming uh, from a Bayesian point of view, and we will discuss that from a probabilistic point of view, what you are assuming is that your labels, okay, the true labels are corrupted by Gaussian noise in this case. Okay, so the, the underlying assumption be behind using a mean square law is that you have some noise in your data and this noise is Gaussian, okay? And so why do we, why is that like a standard choice to use the mean square or even if we don't really know if noise is Gaussian or not, that might not be the case at all. Because if you, you know, in, in many complex uh, phenomena, uh, errors are the accumulation of different sources of errors. They are like the total error that you, that you that you that is summed to your data that is that corrupts your data is coming from many stochastic sources of different types of errors which are not necessarily Gaussian but when you sum many different random variables when many different uh, noises if you want what you get at the end is something Gaussian and this is the central limit theorem right so it's it's natural to take uh, to take uh, Gaussian noise. So there is a question. Could you please explain the use of R2, R square in addition to the MSC? So I'm not sure what you mean by R2 in this case. What is R2, R square? Morally, if you want to just ask the question out loud, it's Yes, R squared, but I don't understand what you mean by R squared. I don't know what this what what is the R squared error. 
Okay, we'll discuss later. Okay. Yes, so the meaning of the MSC, so concretely the MSC, the MSC between, uh, let's say, the vector of true labels and the vector of outputs by, by your model, which depends on the matrix of inputs. Now I'm writing things in matrix form. Okay. Is one over N. Okay. The square deviation between the true labels minus your predictions. Okay, this is just the MSC. Or concretely, this means one over N, sum of I from one to N of YI minus Y theta XI. Okay. All right. Um, I have a question. Yes. Why some people use a, a one over two in mean square error? Doesn't change anything. This is just a, this is just a, a convention. You don't care. I mean, like I said, here you can put a, you can you can put whatever constant you want. The optimization problem is unchanged. If you minimize. Uh, if you minimize a function or a scalar times a function, the minimum, uh, the, the arg mean is, is unchanged. Okay. The, the position of the minimizer is unchanged. So uh, why people put a one over two, I think it's because when we derive back propagation, which are the update rules that allow to update the, the weights in neural networks, uh, this one over two is just convenient in the, in the equations simplifies with a two that appears somewhere because you see that if you have a square at some point we will need to if to really find a minimizer of this function and so how do we find minimizers uh, when we when we don't have any convexity when we don't know anything about the function we just look for extrema which means points and by points here i mean vectors theta such that the gradient of this function cancels, right? Yeah. Right. And so you see that if you take the gradient of the mean square error, you have a square. By taking the gradient, we'll have a two that will pop out at some point. And this two will just simplify with the one over two that you put by convenience. That's it. So there is nothing uh, deep about this one over two. Okay. Okay, thank you. You could put one over pi and you would get the same result. Okay. All right, so I think I'm done for today. So I'm much slower than expected. Uh, I hope that uh, that the pace is not too fast nor too slow. Uh, if, uh, if it is uh, one of the two, please, uh, you can tell me and I will try to adjust, but uh, at least this first course, I think it's important that we set up things uh, you know, cleanly. Um, so yeah, uh, tomorrow I will uh, discuss uh, uh, we'll continue to discuss the learning procedure here, what we want to do, what we call the machine learning workflow, study, which means once you have these three ingredients, which are again, the data set, okay. Once we have a data set, which is put in, in the correct form like this, we have a parameterized model or equivalently an hypothesis class. And once we have a cost function, okay, how to put all these three ingredients together in order to learn a good predictive model. And I will explain
what good means, okay? What do we mean by a good predictive model? And how to get it, okay? Because as we will see, it is actually not enough to just minimize the cost. And we will try to understand why uh, it is not enough, okay? And what are the bad things that can happen if you just minimize costs like this, closing the eyes and hope for the best, okay? So um, I advise you to look at the first notebook that I sent you. Uh, if some of you do not have it, I can resend it. Uh, no problem, just send me a mail. And, um, and it's very important that you actually play a bit with it at first because, yeah, you will see uh, there are many surprises going on. And I think having a first book may help you to understand what we'll say tomorrow. And what we'll say tomorrow is, absolutely crucial for the rest. And tomorrow we'll discuss why machine learning is difficult, and why it's a complicated task to design a good predictive model, okay? Uh, because here, you see what we're doing here is that we are fitting data. We are trying to find a model able to fit the labels in our data. So this, right now we are solving a fitting problem. But this is not what we want to do. We don't want to fit data. We want to design a model which is able to predict on new data. And tomorrow we'll discuss why the fitting problem and the prediction problem are very different problems. Okay. So look at the notebook and, uh, and I will not teach Python in this course. So for those who do not know at all Python, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but uh, you can anyway, you know, learn the very basics of Jupyter notebooks and play with it because essentially the notebooks are completely written. You don't have to do much. You have just to change one or two parameters to, uh, in the experiments to see the, the, uh, the output plots, the, the, the final results and interpret them. But anyway, I advise all of you that, you know, by, that don't know Python to learn about it because it, it, there is no re real point of doing machine learning without at some point coding uh, some experiments and now all machine learning is done in Python so it will be useful for you uh, at some point in your career I can promise you that. All right so tomorrow uh, the meeting is at um, I don't remember uh, if someone remembers I'm happy to know that the meeting is at, it's at 4 p.m. at 4 p.m. yes that's correct Thanks. So tomorrow at 4 p.m. We, we meet again. Okay. All right. See you, everyone. Ciao. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.